Welcome to the second lecture about cellular automata. In this lecture, we we'll learn about probabilistic cellular automata and see how such models can be used to simulate the spread of a disease in a society and how the HIV virus is spread between cells in the body. We'll also learn how to create models with random movements and how to perform lattice free simulations. To see how probabilistic cellular automata work, we will first apply a stochastic component in the game of life model that we discussed in the previous video. Probabilistic cellular automata involve a random event when updating certain rules. As an example, a live cell with less than two live neighbors dies with a probability of 90%. The probability that it stays alive to the next time step is therefore 10%. We can evaluate rules involving probabilities by drawing for example a random number from a uniform distribution where every number is equally likely to be observed in a certain range. For example, the following seven numbers were randomly drawn from a uniform distribution in the range from 0 to 1. Suppose that we should update the state of this cell that is located next to an edge based on the following rule. Since this cell has less than two live neighbors, it will die, with a probability of 90%. To update the cell based on this rule, we can generate a random number from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Suppose that we will get the following number from such a random draw. Since this number is less than 0 0.9, this cell will change its state from 1 to 0. However, if the random number happens to be greater than 0 0.9, the cell stays alive. By using a probabilistic cellular automaton for the game of life model, based on our previous rules, we generate irregular patterns compared to what we saw in the previous video. We now have a look at how probabilistic cellular automata can be used to simulate the SIR model that can for example be used to model the spread of a virus between individuals in the population. We'll here use the Moore neighborhood, where each cell has 8 neighbors. The SIR model includes 3 different states. The individuals in the population can either be susceptible, which means that they have not been exposed to the virus yet, or infected individuals, which can spread the disease to susceptible people, or individuals who have recovered from the disease. These individuals can no longer be infected again or spread the disease because they are assumed to have acquired immunity with full protection from being reinfected. Susceptible individuals can become infected if they are in close contact with infected people. A neighbor in the cellular automaton can be considered as a close contact. After a while, an infected individual will recover from the disease and can no longer spread the virus. In this example, I have used a simple logistic function to compute the probability to become infected as a function of the number of infected neighbors. The parameter values of this function were arbitrarily set to 0 0.6 and negative 1.5. By using these values for the logistic function, the probabilities range from 0 0.3 to 0 0.96 when the number of infected neighbors increases from 1 to 8. For example, if a susceptible individual has one infected neighbor, like in this case, the probability that this healthy person becomes infected is about 30% in the current time step. In comparison, if a susceptible individual has four infected neighbors, the probability that this person becomes infected is about 71%. The probability that an infected individual recovers during one time step which is a week in this example, is here set to 0 0.5. We therefore expect that half of the infected individuals recover during one time step, and that most infected individuals stay infected one to three weeks. Let's have a look at one such simulation. The small gray squares that you see in this lattice represent healthy individuals in a population. The single pink square represents an infected individual, which will spread the disease to its neighbors. The pink color will change to green when the infected individual recovers. 
Note that only a few grey squares are left after the outbreak has ended, which means that only a few individuals did not get infected during the outbreak. We can plot how many grey squares, which represent the number of susceptible people we have over time, as well as the number of infected and the number of recovered individuals. We see that almost all susceptible individuals got infected and then recovered. We also see that the peak of the outbreak is reached after about 35 weeks. We'll now have a look at how cellular automata can be used to model the dynamics of an HIV infection. The following example is a simplified version of the cellular automata that was presented in the following paper. The HIV virus infects human CD4 positive cells, and especially T helper cells of the immune system. HIV therefore weakens the immune system and thereby causes AIDS. Once the virus has infected a cell, it will start to multiply. After some time, the new HIV viruses will exit the cell and infect new cells. The infected cell will eventually die. Cellular automata can be used to model the spread of HIV between cells in the body, since the spread is mainly occurring locally, from one infected cell to its neighboring CD4 positive cells. The cells in this cellular automaton can take three possible states. Healthy CD4 positive cells have the state 0 and are represented by a gray color. Infected cells that spread the virus to their neighbors are represented by the value 1 with a yellow color, whereas dead cells are represented by a red color. The cellular automaton is based on the following three rules. The first rule states that an infected cell dies after five time steps. A healthy cell becomes infected if at least one of its neighbors in a more neighborhood are infected. The last rule states that a dead cell is replaced by a healthy cell with a probability p, or directly replaced by an infected cell with a probability 1 minus p. For this simulation, we use a lattice with 100 rows and 100 columns. The world therefore consists of 10,000 CD4 positive cells. 1% of these cells are initially infected by HIV. Remember that healthy cells are represented by a gray color, whereas infected cells are represented by a yellow color. The probability that a dead cell is replaced by a healthy cell is 97%, and the probability that a dead cell is directly replaced by an infected cell is therefore 3%. Ok, so let's start the simulation. Note how the infected cells die, which means that the color changes from yellow to red, and that the dead cells are usually replaced by healthy cells, which means that the color changes from red to gray. If we now plot the cell densities over time, we see a sudden drop in the number of healthy cells, due to an increased number of infected cells. After this drop, the cell densities show an oscillating behavior that is fading out over time. We'll now have a look at a model that includes movement. Usually the objects in the lattice do not move in cellular automata. However, for certain types of models, such as lattice gas models, the objects can move to the neighboring cells in the lattice. We will here have a look at the basics of how you can move objects in a lattice. In this example, the state 0 represents an empty space, and the state 1 represents the cell that is occupied by some object. The object can here only move to its nearest neighbors in the von Neumann neighborhood, which means that it can only move to the north, west, south or east neighbor. There are many different methods to apply random movement of objects. We will here use a very simple approach to simulate a random walk in a lattice, which could represent a simplified approximation for how a particle diffuses in a liquid. To simulate this, we can for example draw a random number from a uniform distribution in a range from 0 to 1. We then move the object according to the following rules. If the random number is less than 0 0.25, we move the object to the north. If the random number is greater than 0.25, but less than 0.5, we move the object to the south. If the random number is greater than 0.5, but less than 0.75, we move the object to the east. And if the random number happens to be greater than 0.75, the object is moved to the west. 
Let's say that the random number happens to be about 0.11. We then move the object to the north according to the first rule. We therefore change the state of the north neighbor from 0 to 1 and the state in the center from 1 to 0, which means that the object will move to the north and leave an empty space behind. If the next random number happens to be 0 0.72, we'll move the object to the east. If the next number happens to be about 0 0.44, we move the object to the south. If the next random number happens to be about 0 0.74 and we use a priori boundary, the object will move to the east and will therefore appear at the opposite side of the lattice, like this. Let's have a look at a simulation of random walk which follows our rules. Another alternative to simulate movement could be to draw random numbers that generate either the values negative 1, 0 or positive 1. In this example the object is located at the third row in the first column. Let's say that the two random numbers happen to be negative 1 and positive 1. Adding these numbers to the current location will move the object to the cell in the second row in the second column. If the next random numbers both happen to be positive 1, the object will move southeast, and so forth. Instead of moving objects in a lattice, we could for example draw two random numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and add these numbers to the current x and y coordinates of the object in order to obtain a new position. The space is now continuous and the model can therefore be used to compute lattice-free simulations. For example, Let's say that we have an object with an x-coordinate of 10 and a y-coordinate of 20. Now, suppose that the two random numbers drawn from a normal distribution are negative 4 and 5.5. By adding these numbers to the current position, the new x and y-coordinates of the object are 6 and 25.5. We then draw two new random numbers again. Let's say that these numbers happen to be 0 and 2. Then the object will move to the y-coordinate from the 7.5, whereas its x-coordinate is unchanged. Let's have a look at an example of a random walk in a lattice-free simulation where we save its path over time. In the next lecture, we'll have a look at some basic coding in R so that you can implement your first cellular automaton. See you in the next lecture and thanks for watching!